The insight. insight. The insightum. Podcast. Genetics. Human. Archaeology. Denisovans. Neanderthals. Metabolism. Ancestry. Where in the world did we come from? I am. Unique DNA. Genome. From Austin, Austin Texas. Texas. This week, Ancestry Deconvoluted. I'm Spencer Wells, founder and CEO of Insightome, and... I'm Razib Khan, director of scientific content at Insightome. And today we're going to be talking about genomic ancestry with a special guest, Joe Pickerel. Joe, you're on the line from New York, I think. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks for having me. So I'm Joe Pickerel. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Genco. Cool. Tell us a little bit about Genco. It's a new company. Yeah, so this is a new company we started, spun out of the New York Genome Center. So I was running a, a professor running a lab at the New York Genome Center, and we started uh, Genco to make genome sequencing technologies accessible, uh, both to individual people and to, to companies, and uh, interpretable. And so what that means is uh, we help make uh, genomic applications for, for people who want to learn more about themselves uh, through genomics, and, uh, and we do research. So we collaborate with researchers and then help people connect their data to, to research projects. Very so, cool. Very cool. And how's it going so far? So far, so good. We're having a lot of fun. Awesome. And you're using a different approach, technologically speaking, than say, you know, we, we've talked about in, in this month, um, one of the episodes this month, about the chip technologies that say 23andMe and Ancestry use, and about the exome plus sequencing that um, Helix uses. Tell us a little bit about the technology you guys are using. Yeah, so we use what, what's called low coverage sequencing. And so this comes from uh, w when I was at the New York Genome Center, we were working on making how to make genome sequencing less expensive. Uh, and one approach you might take is uh, molecular biology and chemistry, and that's the approach that a lot of companies have taken. And what we were thinking is coming from a statistical background, my background is PhD in human genetics, and I've done mostly statistical work, was that could we, instead of working on the molecular biology, could we instead do this computationally? And so the approach is basically how little sequencing do you have to do to get usable information? And so we do very low coverage sequencing. Basically, we randomly sample around 20 to 30 percent of somebody's genome and then use techniques like genotype imputation and huge public databases to sort of fill in all the missing parts. And that it turns out that's, that's good enough for a lot of applications that you might be interested in. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Razib, I think you've got a couple of specific questions to kick things off. Yeah, yeah. So we are talking about genomic ancestry here. And, you know, you and I have known each other for a while. Could you go back, you know, I think it's been eight years now about your own personal genomic discovery that surprise you had back then? Yeah, exactly. So back in, I think you're right, I think it was 2010, I was part of a project called Genomes Unzipped where we were a group of 10 mostly postdocs and PhD students who were uh, interested in this new consumer genomics technology. And so we all did 23andMe and maybe, I don't even remember if there's anything else back then. And we made our data publicly available online and then discussed it, discussed sort of the, the consumer genomics industry. And within about a day or two of me putting my genome online, an anonymous or pseudonymous pseudonymous blogger that goes by the name of uh, Dianikis Pontikos had downloaded my data and run it through some program and said that, you know, done some ancestry analysis of everyone in Genomes Unzipped and said, hey, Joe Pickerel is mostly for Northern European ancestry, looks like 12% Ashkenazi Jewish. This didn't make any sense to me, right? So I was uh, uh, raised Catholic in a, in a Catholic family uh, outside of Chicago, and we weren't aware of any sort of Jewish ancestry. And so my immediate reaction was that, to this was, you know, this is a great, you know, learning oppor teaching opportunity, rather. And I can talk about all the ways that ancestry analysis can go wrong. Uh, and so I wrote a, a blog post about how, you know, there are a bunch of different assumptions that go into it and how that could lead to false inference of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. But it turns out I, I showed this to some of my family members. They were, they said, oh well, actually that's that does sort of ring a bell, um, and so if you, <laughs> yeah, because twelve well, percent is pretty significant. Yeah, it's, 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 it's substantial, but this was back in the early days when basically that was untested, unproven. Yeah, there, there were no people didn't have priors; they didn't have prior expectations. Yeah, you know, and, and the analysis. So the twenty three and me. This was the the commercially available analysis was basically a dot on a PCA plot, which. It couldn't tell you anything. So this was all coming from this anonymous blogger's analysis, and so I basically discounted it. But it turned as, out as it most people would, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, you exactly. know, that's reasonable. So let's talk a little bit about what it is we're actually analyzing here. 
you know, what we're trying to do is take multi-locus genetic data. And this really, you know, the, the early days of this date back to, you know, my postdoctoral advisor, Luca Cavalli Sforza, working with Anthony Edwards in the 50s and 60s, blood groups, long before people are using DNA polymorphisms. And, you know, they were looking at distances between populations and drawing trees of those populations. And then in the 70s, Luca started to look at principal components. And so this is another way of looking at multi-locus data. So you're dealing with a lot of different variable positions in the genome. And then DNA sequencing comes on board and chip genotyping, where now we're looking at hundreds of thousands of independent SNP positions or relatively independent, because there is some linkage, obviously, between them. And that's why you can, you know, impute things. But basically, you're looking at a lot of data and you're trying to make sense of it. You can draw a tree, you can do a principal components analysis, and that's like trying to describe the shape of an n-dimensional object by, you know, putting axes through it. And so if you think about a football as an example, it's got a long axis and then an axis that's orthogonal to that and so on. You can start to describe the shape. And then there are these new methods that really kind of date back to Jonathan Pritchard's work, structure, um, early knots. And so that's what most people are using these days. And we start to talk about these percentages of ancestry. So tell us a little bit about that and how those methods have developed, Joe. Yeah, so there's there's been a, a lot of work starting. Uh, yeah, I think you're right with some of some Jonathan's work in the early 2000s on uh, instead of classifying an individual as a member of a population or a member of a different population, there's the reality people come from many different origins, or, or any any individual in a species comes from many different origins. They could have a, a you know, for if it's a human, a grandparent who was uh, born in Africa, and another grandparent who was born in Europe, and so you know everyone's sort of a, a Admixture, and so basically, these me- what these methods try to do is to uh, take a bunch of genetic data and and cluster it, and then find the the individuals who are are mixtures of, of different ancestries. Um, the way that way this works is basically by trying to estimate an allele frequency at all hundred thousand or a million genetic variants in different populations, uh, and then see if a, a, a person is better modeled by being you know member of that cluster and having uh, genetic variants that are drawn from those allele frequencies or better uh, modeled as a distribution. And then you can sort of learn the, uh, the parameters, which is how much of the person's genetic variants came from population one or population two or population three. And those are the percentages we, we get out the other end. Yeah, I mean, so the way I like to think about it, the easiest way I think to get it across to the general audience is you have a model and then you have the data. Data is the individual genetic variants. And then you see how the model is fitting to the data what parameters, what values in the model explain the data, right? So when we're talking about assumptions, we're talking about the model, right? We have a model of how the populations are random mating across generations, et cetera, et cetera. We have X number of populations. One thing that, you know, and just like, just a quick introduction, um, you know, I do do scientific content and insight dome, but I have also worked on model-based clustering, DTC, direct-to-consumer apps for family tree DNA and, and um, National Geographic and now Insightome. So I have some experience in this space as well. Um, Joe, in terms of selecting the model, in terms of giving a consumer, a lay person without a background as a geneticist, like, I mean, what are your considerations? What were your considerations? Yeah, so a lot of the considerations from our part is come from sitting down and talking to people and trying to figure out what exactly they, they're looking for, right? Yeah. So in a lot of ways, you want to design the model to answer the right question. It's not about, you know, some, uh, you can just uh, have some statistical model and out come some numbers and it's obvious how to, how to interpret them. You need to design the statistical model to answer a, a question. And so what we spent a lot of time doing is sort of asking people, what do they really want to know? What do they mean when they say, oh, you know, what is, what is your ancestry? And then you try to design a statistical model that can, can, can give a decent answer to that question. I think what, what what becomes kind of fun is exactly that. Like, what what exactly do people mean, and can we approximate with a statistical model this sort of complex notion of of what is somebody's ancestry? Um, well, that, so that's a great question. I mean, what do you find that people are really looking for when they say, "I want to test my DNA and figure out my ancestry"? It's really interesting. So I, I often start like talks around this with saying, you know, three of my Grandparents were born in Illinois, and one was born in Missouri. So I'm, you know, three quarters Illinoisan and, and uh-huh. one quarter. Yeah. Good and, point. And, and people sort of laugh, but it, but it's true, right? <laughs> like if, if three of my grandparents came from uh, Germany and one came from China, then that's exactly what people would uh, would would want to know. 
And so yeah. there's this like psychological aspect of what exactly people are asking that becomes a, a very tricky. And in the United States, what I've found is that people usually mean, you know, where did their ancestors live prior to, you know, colonialization of, of, of the Americas. Basically. Yeah, so what, what came before that hyphen? So if you're Italian-American or Irish-American, tell me about the Italian or the Irish part. And exactly. And it's the same whether it was, you know, a, a 20th century migration, like the Italian-Americans, or whether it was, you know, like a 16th century uh, migration for British people. Uh, it's all those two things basically uh, become the same thing in the sense of what people are asking about. Uh, if they had, you know, a, a ton of ancestors that came over on the Mayflower or something like that, and one Italian grandparent who uh, who came to the U.S. 100 years ago, those are that's what they want to know. The challenge with that is, of course, countries are relatively recent inventions. You know, so Italy was united by Garibaldi in the 19th century. Most people in Italy at that time didn't even speak Italian. That came later. France was, you know, united around the same time, and it, you know, took people from, you know, the northwestern coast that were speaking, you know, Breton, which is more closely related to Irish Gaelic than it is to, you know, the Romance languages like French. You know, all these countries were kind of created out of that rise of nationalism, or many of them at least, in the 19th century. And so they're so recent on an evolutionary time scale, you know, it's hard to see, you know, a genetic signal of that. How do you deal with that complexity? Yeah. So there's, uh, I mean, uh, I'd be interested to hear how, how you all think about it as well. But like, from my perspective, I think we're, we're very quickly moving in that direction with different types of methods that, that allow us to move more and more into the, into the recent past. And I think there have been some impressive moves along these lines from people like Ancestry DNA uh, and other companies where they're using basically effectively uh, trying to find where in the world are most of your fourth or fifth cousins and then using that as an approximation. And then you can start to get down to maybe it's not f French per se or something like that, that your your great grandparents weren't French. Maybe they were actually you could actually narrow it down to say uh, southwestern what is today southwestern France or or something along those lines where you get a very fine grained uh, geographical aspect. Um, and I think that is uh, in principle that that's all possible. Um, you could actually get that detailed. Yeah, um, so I, I think there, there are two issues here. One issue is a scientific one, which is what you closed with. So um, just nerding out for a second, I think you're talking about phasing, doing haplotype donations, like, um, you know, these sorts of Markov models, the fine structure pipeline. We know what we're talking about here, right? So mm -hmm. you look at the genetic data, you don't really classify anything ahead of time. You see what structure pops out. And then you use those to, you know, create your model. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's great. And scientifically, that's what people should do. So um, I think you probably saw yesterday there was a preprint on BioArchive, which talked about a Sephardic ancestry in Latin America using that's that sort of pipeline. Um, and that's, uh, you know, just using regular genotype data, that's actually relatively difficult. You need to have these these haplotypes, et cetera. We don't need to go into the detail, but that's, that is the future. The issue though is not scientific. It's that when, you know, as Spencer said, Italy, you said Germany, what does that mean? So mm -hmm. as you know, um, you know, our mutual friend, uh, Graham Coop and Peter Ralph, they did, uh, they had a publication about, I don't know, was it six years ago on genetic relatedness within Europe. And they saw in Italy, there was a lot of deep population structure. Right. Mm -hmm. So there was more deep population structure in Italy than there was um, to an equivalent time depth than all of Eastern Europe. So does this mean that you create Eastern Europe as one nation and Italy as five nations, mm -hmm. if that's scientifically valid? Right. So it could be that's that's what's scientifically valid. But then when it comes to the consumer, they have no idea what you're talking about when you say that they are 20 percent Italy four, 30 percent Italy one, 15 percent Britain four. Right. Yeah, the kingdom of Sicily and the, you know, I don't know, yeah. the, the, the dukedom of, uh, you know, Lombardy or whatever it might have been. Yeah, I mean, it, that complexity is, is part of the issue. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so, I mean, people want these nation states. They want to be understood in the context of a nation state. And mm -hmm. you have to bridge that with what the genetics is tell, telling us. And, you know, gene flow... I mean, well, until recently, it knew no borders, 
And that is a problem. So in terms of how I deal with it, um, just to be concrete about it, we have tried to emphasize, both Spencer and I, that we are not looking specifically at nation states mm -hmm. because we want to push our customers away from that, but w because we think it's very, very difficult to scale that into the future. Because the reality is these nations are not taxonomically equivalent. So when you say Italy versus Irish, as you know, Irish are genetically much more homogenous. So it's much easier to create an Irish cluster than an Italian cluster when you're talking about a singular cluster. Or let's talk about comparing Chinese or Indian to German. These are not scientifically, they're not equivalent units. But culturally, they are equivalent units, and people understand it culturally, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't give them a PhD in human population genetics, or even history. I mean, you know, <laughs> most people don't know this depth of kind of European history. Yeah, certainly yeah, yeah. Virtually nothing outside of Europe. But no, I mean, this this whole issue. You know, you, you raised this point, and this is something I, I've heard a lot from people who've tested with multiple companies. And you know, we'll come back to like comparing among all the different tests in a minute. But you know, they're like, well, you know, all you told me is I'm Chinese, and surely there's more variation in China than that. Like, if you're European, yeah. you can tell me which country I came from, and you know, all of that. So the whole issue of equivalency and how you tailor the tests to your customers, I yeah. think, comes into it. Well, and, you know, I mean, we are splitting. If we were going to do it scientifically, perhaps, you know, a priori an alien would have a cluster for non-Africans and six clusters for Africans. Mm -hmm. Now try to sell that product. Mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, also historically that you're not giving people the information they want. They want more recent history. As you're talking about an American customer base, they want history that dates to the colonial period or later waves of migration. They want to know biogeographically where their ancestors came from within, like, since Christopher Columbus. They don't, I mean, they kind of do care about out of Africa and the bottleneck that occurred, which was probably the most significant evolutionary genetic event of non African history. But that is not the history that they prioritize, right? So, we have to keep in mind, I mean, I do, I keep in mind what the customer wants. I also keep in mind what insights we can give to the customer, quite literally, because even if scientifically it might not be warranted to separate Eastern Europe from Western Europe, socioculturally, those are very distinct units. They have very distinct rich histories over the last few thousand years. And mm -hmm. I think it is interesting and important to give people that information. Let me make it concrete from the abstract level. I have a friend who married an Austrian man. And when he got his test results back, it said he was 30 to 40% Eastern European. And if you look at where Austria is, it is quite far East. Historically, the explanation of this is actually pretty straightforward. Many Germans in Austria descend from people who were originally Slavic. This is a historically attested process where people converted to Christianity and started speaking the German language to go up in class. So it was totally unsurprising. For him, though, it was surprising because he has no Czech or Bohemian ancestors that he knows of. But that's because this happened a long time ago. And mm -hmm. this was new information for him. This was his own history, which if he had opened up a book, yes, he would have seen that. But the genetic test made it come alive. And it, it forced him to look into the history of his country and understand it in a somewhat new light. Now, a mutual friend of ours, she was very straightforward. She said, look at the map. Look at the map. Vienna is not a Western European city. Look how far east it is. Mm -hmm. So with that information, all of a sudden the geography came into focus, right? And th that's, the sort of, that's the sort of moment that I appreciate and want to enable in our customers. Yeah, I think from, from from our perspective, a lot of this is we, like you, I think we, we, we almost never use country names, sort of current ge geographic, geopolitical borders as, as sort of the, the labels for these types of uh, things that we're telling people. But uh, you're right, it's what it's what people want. And so we, we've sort of taken the approach of we, we somehow have to start pushing the methods to more and more recent history because that's what people are talking about. Yeah, yeah. In terms, in terms of fate, phasing and doing that sort of thing. I guess, I mean, the issue that I would have there is like, I, I do start to wonder about the complexity, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when you have, you know, hundreds of clusters, 
I think a genetic genealogist hobbyist, and there are thousands and thousands that spend a considerable amount of money, they will love it. Um, I do wonder about uh, simplicity, like the whole idea of like think simple and keep it simple, how that's going to work. Because as you know, even biologists, even geneticists that don't work in this field routinely get confused mm -hmm. and have misunderstandings. That really disturbs me because if they are not understanding this correctly, the public can get really confused. And my goal in this is not to put a product out there that increases confusion. You know, my goal is to put a product out there that clears up confusion or illuminates in some way. You know, just on, on a personal note, um, I know, you know, we're getting a little nerdy here. Um, I noticed you had a Bengali cluster. Did you put that in there because of me? <laughs> no, we did not put that in there because of you. <laughs> okay, so, so why did you put that in there? Um, so we, we've been working with uh, some, some colleagues who are, who are interested in the population structure of South Asia. And so we've been working with them just to identify clusters a priori, uh, just, you know, cluster the uh, people who are from South Asia into the, uh, in, in, and then start labeling those. Uh, and Bengali sort of pops out. Like it's partially because there's a lot of public data available on, uh, on like the thousand genomes that maybe that, that yeah. pops out as a cluster, but uh, it's a clear cluster of in sort of like genotype first analysis. So that's why we put it in. Well, I mean, the issue is the recent admixture with East Asians. So it's off the decline of all the other populations, right? So um, on your test, I think, well, actually, it was my, my daughter that was in there. But in any case, um, you know, I usually I'm in the top 1% of South Asians of East Asian ancestry. Mm -hmm. It's just, and like, if you see where my family is from, it's literally on the border with Burma almost. So that, that makes sense um, geographically. So one thing that I, you know, I do want to step back and I asked you about the Bengali, like half jokingly, like I was wondering if it was because of me, but I guess you, you popped that <laughs> bubble is, you know, when I talk to South Asians, for example, one issue they have is like, I mean, what does South Asian mean? Someone mm -hmm. from the North of South Asia, some tests. Um, so for example, 23 and me just just to say, like, okay, what's going on here? 23andMe tends to return very high South Asian percentages for South Asians, no matter where you come from. And an issue that some South Asians have, you know, brought up to me is like, I mean, look at us. We don't look the same. Why are we all 99 to 90, you know, 9.9% .9 South Asian, right? And, you know, I mean, that was just the choice they made with their model in terms of how they were going to assign the populations. So what I did with our current test is basically you can have a Klein, you can have a range if you're South Asian. Our reference population is a particular South Indian group, where if you're from that group, you would be pretty close to 100% South Asian. So but they're if, they're Tamils. Yeah, they're Tamils. They're non-Brahmin Tamils for those people out there who care. And then if you're from Pakistan, you're going to be much more mixed. You're going to mm -hmm. be like 50% South Asian, 50% mm -hmm. Central Asian, this sort of thing. And my goal here is to give people different mixes based on where they're from. I mean, that was that was the decision that I made. And I think if you go with geography, yeah, Americans aren't the best with world geography, but it's a concrete thing that you can show them a visualization really, really easily. And I think with these like more advanced haplotype-based methods, that's also going to be where where you have to go. You have to show a map with a distribution. And then people can like immediately understand it quickly. Now, I mean, we do have to talk about um I don't know what your perception is, but it seems like within the last two or three months, ancestry testing has come into the media spotlight and there's been kind of a, a crest of critiques, mostly some positive, but mostly critiques. Like, like how do you feel about that? I sort of feel like I, I saw these same stories five years ago and probably 10 years ago as well. Like I think ancestry testing is becoming much more popular. I guess you can probably see in your numbers, we see in our numbers. The people who were really early adopters have sort of figured out exactly you know what what it is and then there's a, a new tranche of people who are interested in it and they're having the same confusions that people had five years ago um that what what exactly it can a genetic test tell you about your your ancestry yeah. um and i think i mean i uh, overall i think it I, I think it's great i think the the criticism is is often valid in the sense of i mean i, I don't know exact exactly what people are thinking when they're expecting when they get an ancestry test but the the criticism is sort of saying they're not getting back exactly what they thought they were were signing up for and so what, how i take that is we just need to keep moving in that direction keep talking to to people figure out exactly what they're asking for and see if we can deliver you know a, a scientifically valid thing that, that approximates that better yeah um, i i agree with you joe i mean but i i do think the onus is on the companies to kind of explain the science that goes into this and the fact that it is an ongoing process we're still refining what the, the right mix of these populations should be. 
And, you know, there, there are conscious decisions about, you know, we're going to lump all South Asians together or lump all East Asians into, you know, East Asia or China or whatever it might be. And I think part of the confusion comes when people start to compare their results across yeah. different tests. And they're like, you know, 23andMe told me this, and Incitum's telling me that, and Genographic's telling me something else, and Ancestry's totally different. What am I supposed to believe? That's the, the big question. Mm -hmm. And is there any way to get around that, to maybe standardize it to a certain extent? I mean, I don't know. I'm open to, like, big suggestions. There's so many choices to be made in how you run an ancestry analysis that seems very difficult to standardize. It's not like we're saying, you know, we sequenced yeah. and there's a genetic variant or there isn't, like, right? It's uh, yeah. I mean, choices it's, about how you group populations together, what you call the population. Yes. It's a whole other can of worms. So, you, yeah. Joe, I mean, the way I explain it to people partly is um, the real result is the raw genotype data. There's mm -hmm. no disagreement there. Those are going to be pretty concordant 99.9 or 99.5% of the time, depending on what SNP chip you're using. Mm -hmm. What we are providing, in a way, is an interpretation of that result. Mm -hmm. And so, as you indicate, the interpretation is going to vary. And as Spencer said, people comparing their results is actually, I think, what has changed in the last five years. There are many, many people who are on Ancestry23, Genographic, Family Tree, et cetera, et cetera. They compare them, and there is huge variance based on these choices that we make. And I say the same thing that you say, and yet it is quite unsatisfying to a lot of people because the way they understand science is science measures something. Mm -hmm. And so what are we measuring? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and some people I – mean, I don't we are obviously not doing genetic astrology in terms of like everything is replicable but the models need to be more transparent the choices that we're making need to be more transparent and that way people could understand that they are getting somewhat different windows onto the same thing cuz that's what it is yeah it's that and you know there's also you know what's what's the quote of like the the the, the narcissism of small differences people yeah. see uh yeah. you know I 30% British in one test and 15% British in another test. And someone might see that and be like, oh my God, these are totally different results. Whereas I would see that and be like, yeah, these are basically the same result, like <laughs> to a first approximation. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, and part of the issue is also like, you know, the, the phylogenetic distance matters a lot. And I, in, in the content that I'm going to be producing in the near future, I think I want to reemphasize that to people because they get a um, they get a laundry list. They get a list of clusters and percentages, but these clusters are not equally distant from each other. So, for example, I have had multiple people come up to me, um, white Americans, and they are five percent African, sub-Saharan African, on a direct-to-consumer test, and they ask me, I mean, is this real or is this kind of a fluke? The reason they're asking me if it's a fluke is because they've seen huge variation in assignment of Scandinavian versus British. Mm -hmm. But those two groups are about 100 times closer genetically than African from either of them. And so, you know, I just explained, like, if you're 5% African, um, you need to you're talk to your family. African. Yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> that is, that's a robust result that any test will pick up because the phylogenetic distance is huge. And if people can understand that, I think that will help a lot. Now, when it comes to, say, within these European clusters, there's huge variation, and that's because your reference choices that you're making, in part, are, are, it's extremely sensitive to that because these clusters are very close. I know that one of the struggles these companies have had, you know, including ours, is like it's really hard to figure out a way to represent Central Europe because it's very mixed, and mm -hmm. the population genetic difference between different regions is low from Central Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, so, for example, the, the German, I mean, I've looked at this. I've looked at family tree DNA data, and there's at least three large clusters within Germany, and it's probably due to, you know, where the population density is in different parts of Germany. And you can't just define one of them as German. Yeah, I mean, people forget that there's the Hanseatic North, there's the Catholic South in Bavaria. I mean, there's a lot of variation, yeah, cultural variation, that's reflected in the genetic data. And, you know, you were bringing up this idea that phylogenetic distance between populations matters. I mean, the most gratifying thing for me, and we did a lot of this over the years with Genographic, 
is to test somebody who literally has no idea what their ancestry is, but they come from a very disparately admixed population. Say they come from a Brazilian population where you've got African, Native American, about lots of European populations and so on. And disentangling that is relatively easy and it really gives them deep insights mm -hmm. and stuff that they didn't expect, didn't know about. The most exasperating analysis to do is somebody who is largely Central European trying to disentangle that German versus French versus Belgian versus Danish. You know, that's really hard. And, you know, in all likelihood, people have a conception of what they should be. And you're often not able yeah. to reinforce that for them. And this is another issue. And I don't, you know, I, I want your opinion on this, Joe, um, in terms of your, your, your customer response. There are different types of customers out there that you're trying to make happy because you know the customer is always right some people are very very interested in new things and they're disappointed if you don't tell them something that they didn't know and then some people are convinced that you're wrong because they know and they obviously were aiming for reinforcement mm -hmm. and i mean you can say different things to different people to mollify them but the reality is you're giving it they're both going through the same pipeline you know, and I mean, what are you ultimately, the results are the results. The models are the m models. You can't really change that. And so, I mean, these people, I mean, they need to integrate it somehow. And I feel like we need to change the market and what they are going to get from these results in a way, because there's this range, you know, of people who demand surprising things versus people who demand to be reinforced of whatever they thought. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's tough. We have that. Yeah. We, we we get we get we get all of those, um, and I think, and I think part of it is like I, I get back to so when I when this uh, analysis when I uploaded my twenty uh, three me data to to genome sunzip to so many years ago I immediately I, when someone told me something I didn't already know like I was immediately skeptical yeah and it's sort of a natural uh, it's a natural inclination and the only reason uh, I eventually was less skeptical well, well part of it was genetics was part of it was like actual genealogy someone told me like you know you you were wrong before um, yeah. and here's your family history and I'm like, oh well okay i better better update my information with that and so it, it's going to be tough yeah. like well and also i you know i have to say you're a gene you're a human statistical geneticist mm -hmm. and your initial reaction was like well this has to be wrong you obviously could check it yourself and realized it wasn't wrong. Most mm -hmm. people don't have those skills. And so their reaction is going to be even more incredulous. And I do have to say with genomes unzipped, outside eyes are very important because you're not the only one who had a surprise. Mm -hmm. Right? So Dan MacArthur also had a surprise. Dan, our, our mutual friend Dan MacArthur, he's a broad uh, mass general. And, you know, I think it was in 2013, I just had a computer that was running through public data that I had uh, scraped from various sources. And it popped out a weird anomaly with someone that I had classified as 100% European. And I looked up the code, my internal code, and it was Dan MacArthur. Mm -hmm. The anomaly was a couple of percent South Asian. Mm -hmm. I asked Dan about this, and he's a, he, he saw it in his 23andMe results years ago. But he assumed, like you, that it was an anomaly. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I actually looked at that region of the genome on that chromosome, and I plotted it. And he was pretty obviously South Asian. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening is he talked to his parents. They were also incredulous. And I think his dad turned out to be twice as South Asian as him. Mm -hmm. And then his dad looked into his genealogy, and it turned out that they had an ancestor in the 19th century who was an officer in British India. Mm -hmm. And there is a woman who is missing from the genealogy. Yep. And so case closed, we resolved it. The point that I reiterate, though, is Dan saw the genetic data and actually didn't take any action. It didn't update his views at all because he just assumed, oh, it's just an anomaly. Mm -hmm. I looked at it and I don't know. I mean, I, I assumed it was an anomaly, but after two or three years, I had actually looked at a fair amount of data and I had seen very few Europeans that had that much South Asian ancestry. And so I had different priors, so I had a different expectation. And that's what, as professionals, you know, you just have a little more experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the customers come to us and they, they pay us for the service. But, I mean, the point is there will be people with surprises that will illuminate something in their genealogy. And that's great. That's what we want. 
the, uh, the, the flip side of that, of course, is, you know, we also get a lot of customer complaints because it's confusing to them. And we also have to deal with that. And so we just take the good with the bad. I mean, I feel like that's where we are right now. We're, there's all this media attention and it's because we're at an inflection point. We are probably, we are well over 10 million genotyped on these dense chip markers. And I know you're using low coverage sequencing, so it's somewhat different, but I mean, mm -hmm. basically in terms of the personal genomics market, Spencer and I, we, we looked at the numbers in terms of what we knew and we just added up to above 10 million already. That means it has to be well above 10. For sure. And so that's a lot of people getting these results that to a certain extent, you know, we as scientists are still trying to figure out what they yep. mean. Um, you know, those are great examples where like two people who are <laughs> heavily trained in statistical population genetics and, you know, running these models and interpreting them discount the genetic results because they know their genealogy. Obviously, if you're not a scientist, you know, what are you going to do? What is the way forward? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'd say, again, the way forward has got to be. So the, the reason, you know, you, you, you split out, you know, getting, getting into like, you know, being a statistician here, you have your, the, the data and you have your prior. And like uh, the data now, like for example, when I was getting the, the stuff back on Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, the data did not overwhelm my prior, like on its own. I think now it probably would. I think we've been like yeah. moving totally in the opposite. Like if, if you think of consumer genetics as where can the genetics and the consumer expectations match up uh, and where do they not, if you, you know, genealogy really matches up. You know, you can tell somebody who's the consumer thinks, this can tell me if my cousin is actually my cousin, my dad is actually my dad. Yeah, genetics can do that. On the opposite extreme are things, you know, mostly health-related things where a consumer might think this is going to tell me whether or not I'm going to get a disease and really it's, it's not going to tell you that. And ancestry testing, I feel, has been sort of rocketing from one extreme to the other where the evidence is, you know, what, what you can tell somebody from their genome is getting stronger and stronger and more and more convincing as, as we're sort of putting this all together. I think fundamentally it's it's a set of new methods and having a lot of data. And then it's, it's, it's going to be totally at the other extreme where you could test a random person, tell them some things about their uh, their ancestry, whatever they're surprised about is, uh, you know, almost certainly true. And that's just the way it is. And I think uh, I think we're getting there. Yeah, and, and speaking of getting there, you know, we've been talking for a while about Ancestry. Um, I want to close up real quick. Like, tell me about GenCove. I know you're doing things besides Ancestry. You have partners. I mean, what is your vision for your company's role in the in the personal genomic ecosystem, which we are parts of as well, and the whole industry is growing compared to what it was when Spencer started, you know, Genographic 13 years ago now? So, I mean, yeah, that's not that long. I mean, like, what is what is your vision in the future? I mean, you let – I mean, you left academia, right? I mean, you obviously think there's something that's going on here that's big. I mean, what do you see? Yeah, so uh, I see it. So, like, everyone's always been talking about since the price of genome sequencing is going down, blah, 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 it becomes more important. It's only now that we're actually seeing much of an industry develop around uh, around genomics. And I think there's a huge opportunity, basically, in being sort of the infrastructure, the connection infrastructure. So in, in genealogy, you have a person who's genotyped over here and a person who's genotyped over here. I'm sort of holding up my hands uh, in different spots. And you want to connect them. And they, they want to be connected somehow. And there has to be some infrastructure that connects them. And that's sort of Ancestry DNA or, uh, or 23andMe has services like that, this that sort of connect people. And I think there's going to be other things as well. So one thing that we're doing is sort of where, where's the connection, the connection between the person who has the data and a researcher who wants the data. And so being the sort of connection there, I think is uh, extremely valuable. And I think that's going to continue to grow in value as we get from, as, as you mentioned, it's probably around 10 million people who have access to their genetic data. Uh, I bet in a couple of years it'll be 20 or, and then 50 and then, and then 100 million. And then there's, there's huge value in actually being those connections, either from where the nodes are individual people or where the nodes are one person and one research group or one person and one company. Uh, and that's, that's where we want to be. So, I mean, I guess the question I have there is um, how do people feel about their data being used? Because I've always felt that to get value out of the data, people need to give the data and give information but they're not going to do that until they can get value out of the data. So there was a chicken and egg problem. And then there's the whole privacy thing in the United States, which, you know, it's not just the United States where people are very strict about. It. Do you think we are moving forward slowly but surely or fast? I mean, what is your perception? Yeah, no, I, th I, think, I think it's moving extremely quickly. And so the way we've sort of thought about it is instead of making these decisions for the customer, which is a lot of times what you have to do, we've tried to flip it around and let people make those sort of opt-in decisions uh, one at a time. If, if a research group can say, we're going to do research on this disease that's really important to you, 
give us access to your data, uh, you can say yes or you can say no. And so it, it's, it, you kind of put the burden on the, on the researcher to say, you know, why, why is this worth uh, my time and my, and my data? You know, people have different views on privacy, and I think we need to sort of respect that. There are going to be people who yeah. have their genome on the Internet. Like me one of and you. Yes. Um, and then there are people who don't want anyone to ever touch it, maybe even including them, because if they touch it, then, you know, it might somehow leak into the Google Cloud or something. Uh, yeah. And I think this whole continuum, and we need to sort of respect that. And I think what we've seen with in, in other domains is if you make something that's actually valuable for people, then the privacy concerns, you know, people become less worried about it if, uh, if they're getting some actual value out of, out of sharing their data. Yeah, I mean, I think we all agree here in terms of personal genomics, emphasizing the personal and the choice. And, you know, I think we've all been saying it and believing it and feeling it for, for many years. But now that everything is so cheap and there's a whole industry that's growing up, we're actually actualizing it. Operation, it's making it operational. Um, the future that we have been assuming would come is actually here, I feel. And so now we're like nitty gritty getting down to the details. And it, it's just a great, great time to be in this space. And it's exciting. And, you know, honestly, I'm really excited about where your company is going, your ecosystem is going. And, you know, we have a lot of mutual friends that are also in this space. And since we're all growing, the pie is, is getting bigger. It's it's just good to be optimistic and supportive. And it's been really great talking to you. Um, yeah, if people want to find out more about GenCove, where should they go on the web? Yeah, I'm GenCove.com. G-E-N-C-O-V-E. Exactly. Okay, Joe, this has been great, really useful. And, you know, as Razib was saying, I think it behooves everybody to be more collaborative and all the companies to work together, you know, particularly with this complex subject of, of ancestry. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, great yeah, talking to you. Great. For more information about Incitome, our podcasts, and our genetic products, check out our website at incito.me. That's I N S I T O dot M E. Hey.